Sherman, I hand it over to you, right? Let's welcome Sherman, the start of today. Okay, I'm at Chandong Elementary School in Rodong, Nguyen County. This is what the students see when they first come in in the morning. Uh, this is work. Uh, this is one of the classroom buildings. Uh, it's foggy. I had a bad camera, but it was rain today when I took the pictures. Now, this is the back gate. There's a giraffe and an elephant. Uh, it rains a lot in England. You sometimes see the funny yellow thing in the sky, but it's cloudy and rainy a lot. <laughs> and it agrees with me. Okay. Um, the school is 99 years old. Uh, has 600, more than 600 students, grades 1 through 6. Um, it's a screwy setup. It's a really screwy setup, but I like it. It's cool. This is my class size. It's like six to eight kids. Right? So what they do is they uh, they have two classes per week with their native English teacher, and then during like a study hall or a homework period or whatever, the homeroom teacher will send me one third of the kids. And so I get that one third of the kids for six weeks. And then I get the next third for the next six weeks. The final third for the final six weeks. Um, my biggest class size is 10. 10 screaming little boys. Love them. Okay. Uh, there are 20, I have 23 classes per week. Uh, because there are 23 classrooms, grades through six. That means I introduced myself 69 times. Hello, I'm Sheridan from LA. <laughs> Okay. Um, this is a grade five classroom. Uh, you'll notice that all the kids have name tags. I make the kids have names. They pick their own names. You can see that one's called Bear. Bear's a sweet little girl. Uh, we get a bear, lion, tiger, rabbit. Um, I, I draw the line somewhere. Um, one of my kids told me his name was Dog. I, I'm sure that's the only English word he knew how to spell. I told him, no, your name is Melvin. He likes that better. He likes that much better. Another one was Monkey. I said, no, your name is Bruce. Uh, what the kids are working on is um, I taught a unit on clothes. And so I gave them a human figure. I said, draw some clothes on the figure. And then I was a little disappointed. I spent way too much time on the face and not enough time on the clothes. So I said, I wanted some fashion. I wanted some interesting concepts. And I got a lot of cute faces. Um, if I do it again, I'll have to draw in the face myself first before I copy it again to the kids. Okay? Um, uh, there's nothing to see in this picture. This is the beginning of my observation. You can see one of the teachers sitting in the back of the class. And this is how I teach phonics uh, in my PowerPoint at the beginning of class. I have a section where they have to read random words, um, and then after the PowerPoint, um, I put 15 random words up on the board. They all have short A, they all have SH, they all have whatever I'm teaching for the day, um, and the kids have to hit. I've got fly swatters, I've got plastic, plastic squeaky hammers, and I'll, or I'll hand them a marker because they circle the word that I say. Um, I've got five or six kids still that just kind of blindly hit out at what something. But I, I can watch their eyes, and the first week, they don't know what to do, but like the second or third week, they're actually reading. It's beautiful to watch the change in their eyes. And they actually start to read. So that's, that's exciting. That's how I teach phonics. Um, this is my giant book. Publishers make giant books, but the print is that ain't small, but you can't read it. You gotta be really close to read it. Now I want a big book where the kids have uh, letters, words that are big enough to, to, to see from their chairs. So I got some poster paper, 
six straight pieces, folded it in the middle, stapled it, um, put the text on one side and a picture on the other. I can't draw for crap, but uh, hey, I'm trying. Um, I put white paper on this side for the text, because that way when I draw a magic marker, on the draw the picture with magic marker, it, it can bleed through and it doesn't bother the text. Okay? Um, this is me teaching vocabulary. Um, this is the word duckling. Okay, uh, notice I got a poster on the whiteboard. I've got 16 posters, uh, board games that I play with the kids. So because they come in six week modules, they never have to play the same thing twice. Um, I kind of rely on board games, probably too much, but I can get the kids to say whole sentences. Even in grade three can speak whole sentences. My dad is a bank robber. Um, they can speak whole sentences because they want to play the game. No say, no play. Uh, that's how that works. So this is me teaching vocabulary. If I teach a story like the Ugly Duckling, like I did, you just have to say the vocab word. But if I'm teaching a conversation class, it has to be a whole sentence. And, uh, and they do that. This is Halloween. I was teaching a lesson on large American animals, brown bear, moose, elk, mountain lion, and something else. Um, that's not my sister. That's me and drag. Okay, so that was fun. It's scary. It's really scary. You know, if I change my voice like this and I, and I look like a woman and I sound like a woman, but if, if I don't change my voice, it scares it scares the hell out of the kids. <laughs> okay, um, Cleo. Maybe I don't understand Cleo. Um, I thought I understood Cleo was coordinating with the other content teachers, so you're teaching in parallel. Whatever they're getting in the classroom, they also get the same thing in English. Um, and I can't do that, because I don't coordinate with other teachers, and I don't have any co-teachers. I translate for myself. I made it clear from the beginning. Kids have to understand what I say, and if they don't, then I'm gonna speak Chinese. And nobody told me I couldn't, so I do. Um, so I do phonics, vocabulary, and stories. Uh, vocabulary is minimal. Uh, except some of the sixth graders have pretty good vocabulary, and I don't speak any Chinese with them. Uh, with third grade, gosh, they don't even speak, they don't even understand, understand, or no Chinese. They, they don't get it. They don't get it. So I have to teach them some basic classroom things like that. No Chinese. Do you understand? Stuff like that. Um, kids can, can read random phonics words, but then I face them with a whole sentence and they freeze up. Um, so that's the problem I have. The uh, biggest challenge, I've got, you know, I've got six, eight kids in the classroom. Each with three bears. Daddy bear, mommy bear, baby bear. You know, I got half the kids are all tiabo, tiabo. That's how they talk to me. I don't understand what I hear. Um, so half the kids are tiabo, tiabo, and half the kids are, oh yeah, I know this story. And they're all in the same classroom. How do I help the kids at the bottom without boring the kids at the top? Um, so that's a challenge. Um, the kids at the bottom won't listen because they presuppose. They're not going to understand anything I say anyway. So, and I don't know how to change that. I really don't know how to change that. That's one of the biggest challenges. Uh, I get reverse culture shock when I go back to America, especially in driving. I drive. I forget that I'm in America and I drive like I'm in Taiwan. I almost got a ticket one time and I almost had a crash another time um, because I forget where I am at. Where I'm at. Um, how much time do I have left? Uh, Another five. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. Including um, Q and A. 
we can we can watch the video. The video is a little disappointing, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Want, we can also extend the question time to give you advice. <clears throat> oh, sure. As well. Okay, that'd be better. I'm, I'm nervous enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You guys can take all from there. Okay, I'm done. Well done. Okay. Thank you very much, Shannon. I'm Zach. This is Sean. I'm Cody. Um, we're from Chung Hua. And uh, just like Chris talked about, the structure of my week is a little bit different from uh, the normal. So on Monday and Tuesday, I'm going to find elementary with Sean. Um, and then on Wednesday, I get to meet with all the foreign teachers from Chung Hua. Uh, and then on Thursday, I try to go around to different schools. So I go to, I think it's 14 schools. Uh, in a four-week rotation, and start back over and see the same schools again for round two. Keep going. Um, co-teaching. I have the most amazing co-teacher in the whole wide world. And I'll fight you if you disagree. <laughs> She's amazing. Um, I cannot say enough about how good um, they're easy to plan with. We, if we want to do a special lesson or a special unit, we talk about it beforehand, uh, and we plan it together. So it's amazing. Uh, if we want to do something. She wants to do it's easy to plan together for the reason that I want to do. She's open to all the ideas. Um, and there's okay, some challenges that I've had. Uh, the holidays are weird for me. This is the first time I've ever lived abroad during a holiday. So, like, Thanksgiving is the greatest holiday in the wide world. <laughs> oh my gosh, it was so weird. Like, nobody knew what that was and nobody did anything. That, that was a challenge for me. Um, it is a little bit lonely at times. I live alone, and I don't know too many people who live around me who speak English, so that can be a little lonely at times. Um, being away from family is obviously very hard. Pretty close to my family, so that's a challenge. Uh, and this might sound shallow, but like I'm a big sports guy, and the timing of it with the time change, I, it, the sports that I want to watch are at like 3 a.m. <laughs> And even if I could stay up and watch it and still go to work and be functioning, I can't get those sports on the internet without doing it illegally, so that's been a challenge. <laughs> so some of the good things that I've experienced here, uh, obviously the, the co-teachers is number one. And that's such a great support system, such a good experience with them. Uh, I am blown away with how terrible Americans are compared to Taiwan because everyone here is so nice. Yeah, people are not able to say great. Everyone's so nice, so it's definitely a high. Um, safety is another huge one. I got off the train the other day, and there was a forklift with the keys sitting on the front seat and no one in sight. I don't know about you guys, but where I come from, there, there's no forklift if that happens. Like, that's gone. That was it's so safe here. Um, I was also able to join an improv group uh, where I live, and it's all foreigners, so it's English. And, uh, that's been a really cool thing. Uh, I also played frisbee growing up and at university, and I never thought I would encounter people who play frisbee, but there are frisbee groups at home, and I've joined that. And I've met a lot of really great people. Uh, the food is great here. Not everything, but most things are amazing, so I've really had a good experience with that. And um, I was suffering from big time burnout last year with teaching. I just, I did not want to be a teacher ever again. Yeah, we'll give it another try for all. And it's really made me all about the teaching. Uh, I chose to focus on one unit to tell you guys about. So, in this unit, we were talking about plastics. And we had a special project uh, with the school. I'm going to turn it over to Sean to explain. Uh, next semester, we are, we are doing the ISA project. I'm wondering if you heard this. It's a project that we find an international partner school, and we do the same curriculum. We share 
our results with each other online, like through Skype. And the topic we chose uh, is plastic. Uh, due to the recent uh, government plus, uh, policies to de reduce uh, single-use uh, plastics. So this is kind of like a warm-up activity. Like there is a grocery store right next to our school, and they go there often, and we brought them there to... <coughs> Maybe I should let you tell the story. Okay. Yeah, so we talked about this and planned it uh, in advance, and we just kind of broke it up into three different lessons. So in lesson one, we talked about what is recycling and how there's different kinds of recycling. Um, in part two, we went on a field trip to the grocery store. We got to walk there, so close. And in part three, I told these story about the class. So in part one, we talked about the different kinds of recycling. We talked a little bit about it, and then they created posters to advertise for the different kinds of recycling. So each group, we split them into four groups, and each group took one kind of poster to advertise. Like what would fit into this category? Part two. We went on a field trip and we made a scavenger hunt. So Sean and I went the week before and took pictures of the different products that were at the grocery store and made a little scavenger hunt. So they get their picture and it's small enough that they can't read it, but it's big enough that they can identify what the food is for the most part. They had to write the English name, the Chinese name, and then we started talking about does your family buy it and to see if they experience recycling at home. Um, and then they had to write in what the recycling category it would fall in what the wrapping or however the product was going to be held together to be recycled. Uh, and then part three, I told a story. Um, I don't have the video of this exact story, but it's a video of stories that I tell. Um, so a quick thing about how I teach is I was introduced to this method called story listening. Uh, ben Rose is in front of me. He is the one who introduced me to it. And I fell in love with that thing's amazing. Um, it's called Story Listening, and it was created by Dr. Benito Mason. Uh, and she is in Japan. She created this method, and she started advertising it. And uh, Dr. Stephen Krashen backs the method. And if you put both of their research together, it proves that this method is one of the most, they say it is the most, uh, efficient use of time to teach in a language classroom for your second language, that's L2, it's the second language. Um, and it's supposed to be paired with a reading program. So when I teach, I do the first five minutes of class, a five minute reading, a bunch of picture books. Sean helped a ton of awesome picture books from our school. Uh, so the kids get to go pick out a book and then they just spend five minutes reading. Back, I tell a story, and if there's any time left in the, in the class, we can do a cipher to help them um, but I do story listening, storytelling every day, unless we have a special meeting of the class. So I have a video of it. Uh, before I show the video, um, this method is is huge in comprehensive input. So what that is, is just helping the kids understand it and giving them as much opportunity that isn't just me saying words. So when I tell a story, I draw it on the board, and I act it out, and I'm in an improv group, so like I like to do a little bit dramatic. So you kind of sell the story to them, but it also helps them understand what you're doing. So you know, in the story, we're going to say, eats. Let's just say the word eats. They might not understand. I'm like, eats. You know, they're going to have a much better chance of understanding the word. Um, and then all of the research that goes into it says that this is the most efficient and effective way to learn second language. And I want to show the video, um, but I love this method because it has so many ways of, of reaching a student without having to do all that differentiation. It's inherently already in the method. So I've heard a couple of you guys say, it's hard to teach a kid who has no English experience at all in the same room with a kid who's gone to a bushy bond, you know, for 12 years. How do you teach both of those kids? This is how you do it. It works for me. Um, and so when you're telling a story, some kids are going to pick up just one or two things that are you know, simple words. But some of those kids are going to pick up every single word, and they're going to learn a couple of those big words. 
And the whole time, they forget they're learning English because it's just a story. So I'm going to shut up now. So I have, I put this on YouTube because Dr. Mason, uh, I got to meet her. She was in Taiwan not too long ago. And actually, crash was coming later. Um, but I talked to her and I said, hey, if I send you a couple of videos of me, would you help me grow as a sort of listening teacher? So I just put these on YouTube so it's way easier to send to her. Um, and she actually just emailed me back yesterday. She gave me all this advice on how to get better. So it's super cool. She's super open. If you want to try this, she's super open to it. Hey, this story is called, the name of the story is Zach. Who is Zach? Who is Zach? This is third grade. This is the first story. This is Zach. Heard. Says, 
sex says, no, 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 no. I love pizza. 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 Now, Zach. Zach. So, so, Zach eats. So the whole premise of it. Five. So the whole premise of this story is he goes and he sees apple. That was a the pizza. They go through and they see these different fruits. I tell folk tales and myths and legends, and that really connects with them. And that's what Dr. Mason really uh, thinks is the best way to tell these stories. I've been good stories for a very long time, don't be a real. Um, and as you can see, I'm acting things out and I'm drawing the pictures, and that's all I'm causing the story to put. That helps the kids understand. The third graders is a very different story than the older kids, but it, uh, Ben Rose, he actually wrote this story. Teachers are the best criminals. They steal all the good things. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but Ben does it with junior high, and Dr. Mason does it with university, so it works all across. I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Um, I'm going to tell you about, uh, about the code teaching. My job is to manage class, check students' comprehension, and give foreign teacher support. And I'd like to mention that kids love stories. I don't have to manage the class. Kids love games. I don't have to manage the class. So most of the time, sit right there and I nod. Yeah. Because Zach will ask students, what is castle? Students would, it would be some students know. They would say, Chen Bao. I was just not. That's what I do. <laughs> and. Uh, I'm happy that uh, Zach do the read alouds. He reads picture books to students. After that, we do a five minute reading and story listening. And I can see it really works. Because in my class, I ask them in groups to uh, 
to uh, write the words that we, they remember in that story, like this week. Then in groups, they can come up with almost every word from the story, because it's a story. And also, other than, besides uh, teach, uh, teaching activities, we also have, like, we encourage students to speak to Zach during break. So we give them some sentence pattern. We want students to come to teacher, uh, come to Zach uh, in a polite way. Like, there is a student who comes to Zach every week. He will say, good morning, teacher Zach. My name is Milo. How are you today? Can I teach you a Chinese word? Mm -hmm. He does this every week, every week. And we also do sentence of the week so that I, I encourage students they can add the sentence of the week to the questions down below. They can expand their sentences. And also, uh, also, a sec oh, also does storytelling once a month during the 20 minute break because uh, we want to encourage more students to come here to listen to his stories. Most of students that come, they are first and uh, second graders. And they, when they listen to this story, Zach says, Zach loves pizza, they laugh, they laugh, they laugh all the time. It was fun. So I really see changes in students. Like students in my class never paying any attention. He write notes in Zach's class. I was so surprised. And I see students' motivation enhanced. And I see in my class, uh, I can use more English without translation. So it means their listening ability really enhanced. And I, I can encourage them with more student activity. So Zach's really brings a lot of changes to our school, to our students. So I appreciate, we are very lucky to have Zach. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Zach and Sean. Um, <clears throat> excellent, exceptional, well done. We have some good storytellers here. <laughs> and I could see that the whole audience here was encapsulated by it as well, so well done. Mm. If you want to try it, let me know. <clears throat> I'm going to hand over first to Vincent. Thank you. Um, well, there's First thing I'd like to say is that uh, I'm very I'd like you to see that your interest in teaching was repeated here in Taiwan. Though you seem to have lost your in interest in teaching, but maybe this this story listening kind of kind, kind of help re uh, rekindle uh, say your interest. And, and and from your presentation here, I see some nice things. Like for example, uh, this is a class combining. The learning of English and performance art. Here you're doing everything you can, dramatizing, drawing. It's a kind of multimodal presentation. And, and it helps lower kids to see the story to, to comprehend the story. So that's a great success in teaching. And maybe for Sherman's part, you said that your student was saying something like Tiabo. Tiago is Taiwanese, means I don't quite quite understand. So you have slow learners. Slow learners, maybe they're from less resourceful families, so they have difficulty catching up what you're telling them, the, the nice things you're telling them. So maybe his, his model is something that we can try. And so lots of drawing, lots of dramatization, and catches students' attention so that even there's no slow uh, learners, they can catch up something. You don't have a good co-teacher like German, yeah. So maybe uh, you can. Well, I'm not sure how we help him, okay? Because he's alone, and then we have a helper there. It's not a fair game, but. Well, sure, sure, sure. Because I got this little third grade girl, and she'll come up to me and, uh, what the hell? Okay. And I know, I know what that means. Teacher, I can't do this. Yeah, yeah. And so my automatic response is, Leah, hell. 
Yeah, she wants to argue with you can me. Do it. You can do it. Okay. Um, she wants to argue with me. And I say, no, you're going to take your turn like everybody else. The first week she was miserable, but by the third week she was reading just like everybody else. And picking out the correct word. So her, her, it wasn't that she's a stupid kid. She just lacks self-confidence. Right. Thank you for uh, letting her kind of well, pick up what she didn't understand before. Okay. So good job. I know you have a lot to say, so I'll stop here. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Any feedback, comments so far? Right. Katie. Yes. And then Emma. And then I see David as well. <laughs> no, we were joking last night that you might just hand the microphone to the three of us. Um, thank you both for, for your, your sharing. Um, Zach, I want to thank you for um, reminding me that that exists. Because I remember doing that in my Chinese classroom in the States. Actually, it was um, Justin Bieber loves pizza. We did it in Chinese. Um, but I, I, I forgot that that existed. So I think that I, I, I'm remembering that that was very effective. So thank you for reminding me of that. And thank you for, for being dramatic about that. And um, I mean, dramatic in the. I, I enjoyed the dramatic reading interpretation of your story. Um, sometimes it falls on its face if you don't have the dramatic enough teacher. Um, so you said something about Dr. Mason coming? No, you don't. Sure. 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 Oh. 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 Okay. Oh. Is there any way that we can join that? Uh, you can go to the website of ETA or ETRA. These are the biggest conferences. ETA or ETRA. ETA Dr. Mason came for the ETA conference earlier this year. And people are working to try and do crashes. So it's not just. Hopefully, I don't quote me on it. I'm working on it. So if it does happen, I'll let them do it. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Katie. Anything else you want to add, Katie? Oh, I was also, I, as we were walking in, I made a comment about plastic, and you were telling me to believe everything I, I see on Netflix. Um, so there's been a, a significant amount of research that's been kind of exposed to the world that less than 10% of what we recycle actually gets recycled. So it was kind of funny that you were um, attacking me, in a sense, for, for my comment about recycling, and then it turns out you had done a lesson about um, plastic recycling. But just kind of in general, like, if you guys are talking about, like, environmentalism, like this is something that's a little bit more, like in the last two years, it's become more common knowledge that like, when we recycle things, at the end it tends to end up in the landfill anyway. So, teach your students to reduce their plastic use in the first place, um, and, and make them realize that while Taiwan has a great recycling program, like make sure they understand that like even though they're recycling, it doesn't mean their stuff is being recycled. Right. Emma. <laughs> I was just going to say, Sherman, I, I have that same thing in my English club, especially. I touched on that yesterday. The kids that, like, they're my, some seventh graders, I have eighth and ninth grade, like, all in my English club. And some kids, you say, like, a word to them, and they're like, what? And the other kids can ask me these, like, profound questions that we, like, spark discussions. So it's, it's tricky. Um, but what I found with them is I, I mean, it takes a lot more planning but I do a lot of like group work where I'm like, this is what you're doing today. And then I just like step back and I like watch it happen. Cause I've had a lot of kids that like they seem kind of confused, but then their classmates are having fun and they might see somebody else like not join in. And then they'll be like, oh, come here. And then they'll like start kind of teaching them the words. Or like recently I've been doing a lot of like teach the teacher kind of stuff. So we did that with Chinese New Year. I told them like what we do in the US and I was just like guys I don't know anything about Chinese New Year and I gave them like five topics to pick from and I was just like go in whatever group you want pick what topic I was like guys like let, like I don't know anything teach me anything so I had some kids that are just like like this and like and they can come and ask me questions along the way like like they'll draw something and they'll be like what is this in English and then we'll like talk about it but like I have some groups, like I said, that they'll go up and they'll be like, we wear red for Chinese New Year because it is lucky. And then other kids will be will like, will point and they'll be like, tangerine, yummy, lucky. And it's like, perfect, great. And so everyone's, everyone's participating. But yeah, that, 
the extra work put in, the like teach the teacher independent stuff, I found it's not perfect and it doesn't work with every group of students, but it's it's a start. Thank you, Emma. Uh, David, did you have a question, comment? Uh, okay. You want the microphone? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, this is just uh, thinking out loud. We had a lot of great discussions last night in, in a group, and everyone has had a very, very positive experience here, in particular, when Zach talked about being uh, rekindled in teaching. I think all of us, after this long semester, um, just this past couple of days, has made us feel very integrated. We have all these new ideas bouncing off of each other. So we think it's a better idea, or we'd like to request as a group that we have more of these. That perhaps during the first semester, around the midterm, between August and January, we meet again in October or November because already the experiences that we've had, different things that we've learned, it's going to help us in the long run. Um, whether it means a Thursday, Friday where we have to miss classes, or even if we travel Friday night and do a Saturday thing and go on Sunday, it also just allowing us to hang out and talk together too has been so much fun and we've made relationships. So we, just, we would love it if we could do this more often. Great idea. I support that. Show of hands. Yep, with the, Vincent, there we have it. <laughs> right? Thank you, too. <clears throat> Sean. I'd like to respond to Katie about the recycling. Uh, this is just a warm up activity. Follow up, I didn't mention, follow up, we have follow up activity in my class. We discussed, uh, uh, I asked students uh, what uh, recycling category are those uh, products. And most of them are plastics. And I asked them where do they go to after you throw it. And students say in the plastic, in the, in the trash can. So most of them did not go to go, uh, to be recycled. And that's that's a uh, that's the first step. The major goal we want to achieve is that we reduce, not recycle. So we, we have follow-up activity next, at this next semester. Thank you, Sean. Any other comments, questions? Right, listen. Uh, I, great job, guys. I'm really inspired. And, I don't know, Zach, I'm definitely going to be story listening, for sure. I think that's the best way to involve your students. And, Sherman, I just had a question. Why did you dress like a woman? <laughs> What what lesson were you teaching them a certain topic? Oh, I was listening. Okay. Typical. I don't know because I love yeah. Having. That's the only holiday I celebrate. It's Halloween. You do that at home as well. <laughs> What was the response of the principal? The very lovely direction. Direction, yeah. Okay, okay. Kind of cute. Yeah, I thought it was sexy, but cute is better. Anyone else? Um, yes. Donna. I lost my passion for teaching in South Africa and I felt like I wasted my life studying this degree that I didn't want to do. I didn't want to use the STEM degree because I was like, what am I doing? You know, and a lot of people have a negative stigma for teachers in South Africa. It's like those who can't teach, you know, so you're kind of dumb if you're a teacher because you could do so many other things. But here, teachers are respected and loved. Kids love their teachers. And uh, one of my friends encouraged me, go, go abroad. Teach as an ESL teacher, see if you find your passion again. And I feel the same way you do. I did. I found it, you know, and I think I've learned how to be a good teacher from the local teachers here. And I've learned how to put in my best effort because of what they give you. You know, they love their teachers. So you want to do your best to, 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 to earn their love. And uh, I'm glad you found your passion because, wow, it shows. It's great. Yeah, so thanks. I, I would like to latch on to what Don is saying, but also what David said. You know, this, this, these three days are exactly for what this is all about. Learning from experts such as yourselves, 
Um, because, I mean, there's wonderful gesture, acting, and, and imagery going on here. So you have a gift. You all have a gift. You are damn good teachers. Now we must just take it further. Um, so we're learning, but it's also about sharing as well. And I'm, I'm looking at Sherman here. Why, is your, why did your school divide the, the grades into thirds? Yeah, into threes. Um, I don't know why. I, I'm not sure why they did the program the way they did. Um, I, I think they didn't want to cut the local teacher's time too much. Um, because the government reduced class from three to two. <laughs> So, um, using a homework period was, you know, if the kids don't do their homework, they have to stay in the classroom and they can't come to English class and play games. Um, okay, I'm, I'm asking that question um, because one's always looking at ways of trying to solve it for you because you have in your group students that are upper level, middle, and then lower level achievers. Maybe as a suggestion, ask, with the keyword ask, your English department, and of course your director of academics, can you not have the students grouped into top achievers, middle, average, and then also your low achievers, so that you can plan your lessons accordingly. I don't know if the school could do that, but it would make your job a lot easier, and I'm sure it'll make the other English teachers' jobs a whole lot easier as well. I mean, nothing is insurmountable. So, just as an idea, um, Sharon, I did like the way you're teaching, okay, so don't be all, you know, despondent. And of course, the drag, and that. You're, you're very brave. <laughs> but then again, I'm looking also at Zach here, I mean, to, to teach like this, I mean, you have to be brave as well, and it's, it's innovation. Um, so it's got my mind ticking as well. I can't draw as well as you, but certainly, you know, it's got me thinking in that direction. Shevin, I would just like to uh, talk a bit about the Clil, okay? Um, yeah. Just dabble with it. Just just play around with it in the beginning. Where you just, in your English lesson, just bring in a little subject, okay, very gently. And then, as Vincent mentioned the other day, the content is king, okay, with language as the medium. But just make sure you balance it in such a way that it meets the level of those students. So don't be afraid to tackle it. And then once you've got into it, I mean, I'm looking also at Lauren. Where's Lauren? I mean, you put your big toe into it and everything else by the looks of it. <laughs> you've got to start somewhere, okay? And, and just do it gently. And even if it's just a sentence or two about something of, a, of another subject, okay? Just try it out. See how it is. And see if you can't raise the bar of it, okay? But just gently. Okay. Um, anything? Uh, Zach? Yes, yeah, please. You've got three or four minutes. So, I just want to encourage people, if you want to try it, you think you're bad at drawing, I'm worse. And, like, nothing on there was impressive. The pizza is a triangle. My face is two circles with a triangle as a nose. Like, nothing on there is good. And actually, the best things that happen in a story is when you try and draw something and fail miserably. Like, Sean's laughing already because... I cannot say how. I drew a chicken the other day in my story, and the kids were like, frog! <laughs> but you know what? It was amazing. Everybody started engaging with the story. So if you want to try this, but you think you're bad at drawing, I promise that's good. Like, if you're a good drawer, this isn't going to work because you're going to go slow and make it look nice, and then you're going to lose the flow of the story. If you're a bad drawer, this is for you. Give it a try. Uh, and then another reason why I love this is what do you need? Chalk and chalk. I, I mean, yeah. if, if you want to have a longer story, you have the story written out for you, and I do that every time, but this can go anywhere. Like, it, it can go in any room, it can happen with any age, all you need is chalk, chalkboard, and your story in your head. Zach, do you ever have kids draw as well? Because I can see interactive where they have a whiteboard, and then right now show me pizza, and then they... students who like remember something or discuss about the story and I would just have students raise their, raise their hand to remember anymore in teachers that story and we because they can get stand they, can, they keep raising their hands and next time I've noticed that they take notes they write down every word so next time 
I asked them, hey, some students are so confident. He had any, every word in his paper. So I, I asked him to, I, uh, can you make a sentence with this word, uh, either from the story or you make a sentence from this word? Or next time, because I know there are certain students who cannot write words, right? So I come up with a word, or students come up with a word, and, and I, I, I ask each students from each group to come up to the stage and they draw, they just draw. Oh. Like squirrel, what is squirrel, please draw. Everyone can do that if they are paying attention or if they are involved in the small group discussion. I asked them to come up with words they remember uh, to write it all in, on the mini board, on the mini whiteboard, and I'm sure they have this conversation, like discuss the story. And one time I asked them to not write the words, draw the story, draw the whole story. And I sent a picture to Zach. One group draw everything from the story. I think it's cool. Thank you. I just want to latch on to what David is saying. At the end of the day, it's about us improving students' communication skills and even using imagery. I mean, there you're already, you know, getting them to do something, to think via images, because often words aren't enough. It's up to us to be innovative. I just want to ask a quick question, because Zach is saying we can all draw like little squiggles. Do you know, those of you who have done this, is it effective in any way if you kind of prepare the images in advance, or is the joy of drawing the pictures part of the joy of drawing the pictures? So like it would not work as well, yeah, the, the fun. So if, if you would prepared pictures, maybe it would lose the... Well, it, you just have to balance it, because they like, they like come with you when you're drawing it, and they enjoy seeing it, but like I did a story about pineapple, and I couldn't figure out, and I didn't know the Chinese word for pineapple, so I just brought it. I had one sitting around, so I brought it. And I drew the pineapple, and they're like, dude, that's a square. I don't know what to tell you. Like, you know, I don't know what that is, and then I pulled out the pineapple, and they're like, oh, cool, pineapple! <laughs> Oh, it's like a balance. Using the imagination. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, uh, I was just wondering if about uh, shaman, is that right? Shaman's uh, class sizes, if the reason they organized it that way was to reduce the size of the classes so it's a smaller number of students in the class, which can also make it much more effective. Sherman. Oh, Sherman, sorry. Sherman, uh, effective for uh, teaching. Um, it's it's really cool to have just six kids in there, so I can make a lot of progress with six kids. It's really cool to have like like six kids in there because I can make a lot of progress with the kids that way. Um, if I had thirty kids in there, it, I, I could make some progress, but it'd be slower and not as effective. So it's nice to have a small class size. Good, thank you, thank you. For that question, Peter. Right, um, we've got a break time. Uh, first of all, this is an excellent session. This has really started the day off well. Thank you, thank you. And also, for your comments, questions, and queries, we have a break until 9:35. Okay, I look forward to the next session. Thank you.